Maybe you're wondering why on Christmas week we're talking about the resurrection of Jesus. And there we go. Um, because Jesus said when he came and he's getting ready to go into the garden, he said, I was born for this very reason, to suffer, to die on the cross, and to rise from the dead so that we could have eternal life. The reason Christmas is here, the reason we even have a Christmas is because it looked forward to the ultimate event of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Besides, this is the issue I've spent most of my time studying, so we're going to talk about the resurrection. Um, you know, we're all, we all have our idiosyncrasies, don't we? And one of mine is that I'm a second guesser. You know, I can't even go into a department store and purchase a bottle of cologne without wondering whether I got the right thing or if I should have gotten something else before I even get out of the store. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And don't you hate that? Well, if you think it's difficult to, uh, on a second guesser, to choose a bottle of cologne, think of how difficult it was for me to choose a wife. Now, when I went to Liberty University, I wanted to come out with two things, a good education and a good wife, and not in that order. And uh, so when I got there, the first thing I started to do, I, realizing that there was about a 50% divorce rate out there, maybe even more than 50%, I wanted to make a good decision. My parents had been divorced. So I came from a divorced family. My stepdad had been divorced and, I mean, lived in a Christian family now, and they'd gotten their lives together and gotten saved and stuff, and I'd gotten saved. And uh, so we wanted to, I wanted to have a good marriage. Uh, by the way, any of you divorced here, I'm not insinuating if you got divorced, you're not a Christian or anything. I'm just saying this is my story. So um, I wanted to have, to have the best shot at my marriage I could, and so I started asking all these married couples. People had been married a while, you know. You know, you've been married a while. What's necessary in marriage? What should I be looking for? Um, what are the, 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 there are going to be some things that I'm going to be looking for that now that you've been married a while, you know that it's not that important. And there are some other things that aren't even on my radar that you would know would be important. So tell me, let me learn from your mistakes. <laughs> if you were to do it again, what would be the things that you would say would be the most important thing to look for in a spouse? So I would take, I interviewed a couple dozen couples and I took their answers and I wrote them all down and I got these answers and then I cataloged them and I came up with what I called the five C's of complete compatibility. This marriage brought to you by the letter C. And so by the time I got to graduate school, when I'd ask a girl out on a date and I'd finish up, then I'd come back to my uh, room that night and I'd start a file on her. And I would list those five C's and I'd say, okay, here's how I think we're jiving in each of those five areas. And then I'd put, okay, here's some questions I want to ask her on the next time for clarification, because I think we might be a little deficient in this C. And so let me ask these questions and see if we're jiving in this. And I mean, it was all just this cerebral this exercise, but I wanted to assess this thing and analyze it to death because I wanted to make sure I was making a good decision here. And so um, if at any point along the line, after a couple of dates, I felt like, I mean, you're not going to have 100% in each of those five areas. But, you know, if you're down in one, you want to definitely have some compensating factors in another. All this stuff I was trying to figure out. So finally, I met this girl named Debbie, and we, uh, it's like, okay, this is going to be a good decision here. I, I can't go wrong. And so we got married. But even um, after all that working through that, I doubted all the way up to the altar. <laughs> I remember standing at the altar on my wedding day, April 4th, 1987, and there's like these, these two guys on my shoulders. And one guy was saying, Mike, relax, you made a good choice. You really thought this thing through. But the guy on my other shoulder, he wasn't so sure. And he was pacing back and forth, and finally he yelled in my ear, got close, and he said, run, Forrest, run! <laughs> well, I'm glad I didn't, because I've been married 23 years now, and I think it was, it was good to work through that situation like that. But even so, I still doubted, even after I was married for some time. Well, if you think it's difficult for a second guesser to choose a bottle of cologne or choose a spouse, think how difficult it is for someone like me to choose a worldview, or at least to remain comfortable and confident in the one in which I currently embraced. I mean, after all, if I made a bad choice with a bottle of cologne, I only waste $40. Make a bad choice on a spouse, I could have a miserable life. Make a bad choice on my worldview, it could cost me eternity. So I want to make sure I had this thing right. Not just be, remain a Christian because that's the way I was raised, but I wanted to know that this was the truth and follow it this way. Because I was telling, I was out there telling Muslims what they believed was wrong and 
Everybody else said what they believed was wrong. And I didn't really, to be honest with you, know what they believed. <laughs> yep, I got the answers. Now, what's your question? So, and, and I know I'm not the only one that does that. A lot of people do that. But, you know, I stepped back and I thought, well, everybody thinks that way. They tend to believe the way they've been raised. So how do I know that what I believe is true? And if it's not, I don't want to devote my life to a fairy tale. And, I mean, I don't want it to cost me eternity. It's not worth it to me. I need to find the truth. And I need to know why it's true. And so this really bothered me. I almost gave up my faith several times. I'm just thankful for someone, a professor, Gary Habermas, who knew apologetics. I'd, I'd never taken apologetics or anything. It hadn't really concerned me. I wasn't an academic. In fact, when I was in, um, I was one of those gifted students. You know, when they gave me a C, it was a gift. I'm so slow, it takes me two hours to watch 60 minutes on Sunday, you know. In all honesty, I have an average IQ. My dad told me what it is. I shared the number with you, but I forgot it. Um, but I have an average IQ. Um, my uh, GPA in, uh, in uh, college was 2.0. Um, I didn't do too well. Found out later on I have ADD, which means attention deficit. Oh, what is that over there? <laughs> you know? So I had all these struggles, and, 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 and I'm just not the kind of person you think would be an academic. But... My doubts pressed me into this area. I never thought I'd go on for a master's degree. Finally got one, and then I thought, I'm, I'm done. But then I really started to doubt my faith, and that's what led me into my Ph.D. work. And I went overboard in it. You know, it's like, uh, I, I think you were, or you were talking about the book. It's over 700 pages. It took me over six years of research. But I had to cross every T and dot every I. I wanted to know whether the resurrection actually happened. Not based on faith. I mean, I know we have to have faith. Uh, You've got to have faith in that Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon River in 49 B.C. because you didn't see it, right? You've got to have faith that um, Octavius' defeat over Antony in 39 B.C. We didn't see it. We can't talk to any of the eyewitnesses, but we believe it because there's good historical evidence for it. So I wanted to know, is there good historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus? Am I rational in believing the Christian faith? I engaged in this kind of research, but it was very serious to me. I wanted to know whether this was true, and if it wasn't, I would, I would jettison my faith. I realized that as a Christian, I had my own biases. I wanted the resurrection to be true. I wanted Christianity to be true. It's a hassle to change world religions. I would upset my parents. My wife married a guy, she, went, she thought I was going into the ministry, and now I'm entertaining other religions and atheism. So it's like, okay, you know, and I don't want to hurt people, but it's like, okay, but this is my soul. This is nothing to play around with. This is the eternal destiny of my soul. I don't care who I disappoint. I'm going to find truth, and I'm going to follow it, no matter what the costs are. So I engaged in uh, public debates with atheists, agnostics, and skeptics, and Muslims all over the world. I wanted to do it because I realized with my bias, I would have some blind spots. I wanted to see, uh, after they had something, uh, that they, they would be motivated to find weaknesses in my view. I wanted to know what those weaknesses would be. And could the resurrection of Jesus stand under the most critical of scrutiny from some of the leading minds in North America? And I want to tell you, after 14 debates, and after studying this issue for years, I'm more convinced than ever that the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus can stand the toughest of skepticism. And so I want to talk to you about that today. I'm going to take take a little bit different approach than maybe what you're used to. You're probably going to think I'm going to go right to the Gospels because that has the resurrection narratives. I'm not. I'm not even going to use the Gospels this morning. The reason being is because scholarship is, I believe that the Gospels are historically reliable documents. But scholarship's kind of divided, and there's all different kinds of opinions on the Gospels. I'm going to appeal to some literature that predates the Gospels. Letters written by a guy named Paul who was a skeptic when he had an experience that he thought was of the risen Jesus to him. The reason this is important is because if, if, if I can build my historical case based on Paul's letters, it doesn't matter if the Gospels are unreliable. It doesn't matter if they have all sorts of errors and contradictions in it. I could even grant that. I don't, but I could even say there are unreliable historical documents, and it wouldn't matter because they come after Paul's writings. be like saying, well, what about these Gnostic Gospels? I mean, that's a different issue, but what about these? Well, I mean, if I can show these Gnostic Gospels are crazy, insane documents, that doesn't do anything to the canonical Gospels because they came after the canonical Gospels. Same thing with the letters of Paul. 
They are our earliest Christian literature, and they even predate some earlier literature than his own writings in there. We'll get into that in a moment. So here's what I'm going to do this morning. I'm going to build a positive historical case for Jesus' resurrection using two major building blocks, facts and method. Now, let's start with the facts. I'm going to give you five. Around uh, 30 is when most historians believe that Jesus was crucified in April of the year 30. Now, shortly after that, within one to three years, let's call it two years, there was a skeptic, a persecutor of the church named Paul, who arrested Christians, beat them, consented to their execution. He threw them in prison. Um, And then all of a sudden this guy became a Christian because he had an experience that he believed was of the risen Jesus appearing to him. So if this happened one to three years after the crucifixion, let's call it two years, now we're in the year 32. All right? So our first fact is that Paul believed himself to be an eyewitness of the risen Jesus, and he was hostile at the time of his experience. This is important to note because it's not just friends, disciples who believe Jesus rose from the dead. It's at least one enemy, and a a really zealous enemy at that. Imagine Osama bin Laden today saying that he was in a cave for the call to prayer, and then this big bright light shone throughout the cave, and then a voice bellowed throughout the walls of the cave, and it said, Osama, Osama, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? He says, I am Jesus that you are persecuting. Now go, and I will show you the things that you must suffer for me. And he goes out and he calls all these Muslims together who are fighting with him, and he says, brothers, I got to tell you, I was in the cave, and I heard this voice, and it was Jesus. And I want to tell you, he's, he's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. And we have been part of a false religion following a false prophet. And we need to follow Jesus for eternal life. And they pelt him with stones. That's what we have with Paul today. So it's not a friend that sees the risen Jesus. It's an enemy. And this happens around the year 32. Now, according to Paul, in the, his letter to the Galatians, chapter 1, a letter which virtually every scholar who studies the subject, even atheists, agnostics, Jewish scholars, agree, Paul wrote Galatians. In chapter 1, he says, three years after his conversion, or around the year 35, Paul visited Jerusalem and met with Peter, the lead apostle, and also James, the brother of Jesus. Now, it's interesting, our English translations say he visited with them, or he met with them. But the actual word here is the Greek word hysteresi, from which we get the English term history. What this suggests is that Paul went up to visit with Peter, to meet with him, to get a history of the life and teachings of Jesus. After all, Paul had not been one of Jesus' disciples, so he wanted to get the whole nine yards from one of those who had been. He goes straight to Peter for it. This is around the year 35. So our second fact is that Paul knew Jesus' disciples. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul says that 14 years later, he went back up to Jerusalem. Now, we don't know if that's 14 years after this or 14 years after his conversion. So we're going to look at, we go, uh, now we're 16 to 19 years after Jesus' crucifixion. And we're, or, yeah, the years 46 to 49. And Paul says he goes back up to Jerusalem to, and he met with the disciples, the lead apostles. In fact, he calls them the pillars of the church. Peter, James, and John. So there's Peter again, there's James again, and now he adds John. Three leading apostles in Jerusalem. Why did he meet with them? He tells us. He wanted to run the gospel, the message that he had been preaching past them, to ensure that he had not been working all these years in vain. He wanted to make sure that he was preaching the same thing they were preaching. And he says, they extended to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. In other words, they were saying, Paul, you're good, bro. Keep up the good job. Keep up the good work. So, according to Paul, 16 to 19 years after Jesus' crucifixion, he's preaching the same thing on the essential doctrines um, that they're preaching. You say, well, yeah, it's Paul doing it. Maybe he's lying. Well, maybe. As a historian, I can't prove that he wasn't lying. But I do have some really, really good evidence that suggests that he was telling the truth. Because you see, years later, around the year 95, 90 to 95, around the same time the Gospel of John's written, And then a little after that, maybe around the year 110, there's another piece of literature written. 95, there's a guy named Clement of Rome. Clement of Rome was probably a disciple of the Apostle Peter. And he wrote a letter to the church at Corinth called First Clement. We still have that today. 
And then a little bit later, we've got Polycarp who wrote a letter to the Philippian church. It's called uh, Polycarp's Letter to the Philippians. Now, since these probably knew Peter and John respectively, it's real interesting to see what they have to say about Paul. Because if they're discipled by Peter and John, and Paul is preaching something essentially different than what Peter and John were, then we would expect Clement and Polycarp to chide Paul and correct him on it, wouldn't we? Especially since Paul's dead and can't fight back at him. What we do find is that Clement says over here, Clement, and I quote, Paul accurately and reliably taught the message of truth. And he also uh, places Paul on par with his mentor Peter. Polycarp refers to the blessed Paul, quotes from his writings twice, and refers to them as part of the sacred scriptures. Whoa, sacred scriptures. You don't say that about someone who's teaching heresy. You do say it about an apostle who was teaching the same stuff as Peter and John were, though. I could give some more evidence, too. I just don't have time. So there's good evidence to show that Paul was preaching the same stuff in terms of the essential doctrines of Christianity as the lead Jerusalem apostles who had known Jesus and walked with him were. So, fact number three, Paul taught what they taught. By the way, just to give you an example, a little more of this timeline here, remember this is 46 to 49 or 16 to 19 years after the crucifixion that Paul is meeting with the disciples the second time. A couple years later, in 51, Paul goes up to a a Mediterranean city called Corinth uh, and established a church there, the First Baptist Church of Corinth. And then a couple years later, he was responding to one of their letters, a letter we now, uh, a letter he wrote responding to one of theirs, one that we now call 1 Corinthians. He writes that probably between 52 and 55. So now we're talking 22 to 25 years later, after the crucifixion. He's had contact with all the Jerusalem apostles during this time. Let's go a little further. Mark, there, there's controversy over this, and we're really not sure, but Mark wrote his gospel first, most scholars believe, around 65 to 70 A.D., and then Matthew around 80, Luke 85, and then John around 90. All right, so 35 to 65 years after the crucifixion. This is pretty recent by ancient standards, although it may not be by modern standards. By ancient standards, it is. Um, and, but even the 35 years later, it's not like we don't have anything about Jesus prior to the first gospel. You can see we've got some really reliable testimony from Paul, who was teaching the same thing as the Jerusalem apostles. Okay, now with that in mind, Paul was teaching what they were teaching. Now, what were they, were te- what were they teaching? When it comes to the resurrection of Jesus, there is this text in 1 Corinthians 15. Because the church at Corinth had a bunch of questions to ask Paul. One of those is, what about resurrection? You know, what, what's it going to be like? What, what, what kind of bodies are, are there going to be like in the resurrection? And so Paul answers a bunch of these questions. And he answers in what scholars now say is uh, pre-Pauline material in an ancient creed that predates the writing of the New Testament and goes back to the Jerusalem apostles. And here's what he says. He says to, to the Corinthians, I delivered to you what I also received. So if Paul's writing this letter somewhere between 52 to 55, he's saying, I delivered to you what I also received. Delivered, past tense, what he had received, past tense. When did he deliver it to them? In 51, when he established the church. And, of course, he received it from others before then. So, again, we're very early. What did he receive from them? That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, then to the twelve, then to more than 500 at one time. Then he adds, most of whom are still alive, but some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles, and then, then Paul adds, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. What's interesting about here is we've got, again, it's very early tradition. Remember, Paul is, whenever the Gospels were written, I mean, they're, they're out here 35 to 65 years later. Paul's writing this letter within 22 to 25 years of the crucifixion, but he's given us tradition that he gave to them 21 years after the crucifixion that he had received from the Jerusalem apostles even earlier. So whereas it's difficult sometimes to date the Gospels precisely, we can date this material, and it's very, very early and goes back 
to the Jerusalem apostles, the eyewitnesses of Jesus. This is just the kind of stuff historians drool over. It's such a, a, a good source for us. Now, in this creedal formula, Paul says he mentions three uh, individual uh, appearances of Jesus to individuals and three to groups. The individuals, Peter, James, and Paul. Now, remember, he met with Peter and James twice. So he has heard this directly from Peter and James. And then Paul, of course, he knows himself. So we've got direct firsthand testimony here about these three individual appearances. When it comes to the group appearances, they're so um, vital because it's, it's known in modern psychology that hallucinations are extremely rare, if not impossible. Group hallucinations. Let's give you an example. Let's suppose um, the reason that you are experiencing me here in a visual and auditory sense is because I'm here. If I'm here and you have eyesight and hearing that works properly, chances are about 100% that you're going to perceive me visually and auditorily. But let's suppose that I'm not here. What's the possibility, what's the probability that your pastor is going to perceive me visually? Very low, isn't it? Um, he'd have to be hallucinating. Well, the modern research has shown that the group most likely to hallucinate are senior adults bereaving the loss of a loved one. In multiple studies, it averages about 50% will have some sort of a hallucination of their deceased loved one. In most cases, 39% of the cases, that's 39% of the 50%, or about 20% of all bereaving senior adults, they experience their loved one in a sense where they, they have the sense that they're present in the room. They don't see them, they don't hear them, they just sense that they're in the room. Only 14% of the 50%, or 7% of all bereaving senior adults, have a visual perception of their loved one in the room. 7% of the group most likely to experience, the highest percentage experiencing hallucinations, only 7% visually perceive that person. So, because he's not grieving over me, it's even less than 7% probability that he is going to experience any sort, or, or let's say a visual hallucination of Mike Lacona. Well, what's the probability that the two of you and your pastor will have a visual hallucination of me if I'm not here? Well, it would be less than 7% cubed, wouldn't it? What's the probability that every single one of of you in this room will experience a visual hallucination of me. Remember, 7% of bereaving senior adults. We're talking about 100% now of all of you in the room experiencing a visual hallucination of me and doing so simultaneously. And it's of me. Remember with the disciples, they, if, even if they're all prone to hallucinate, which they're probably not, but if they're all prone to hallucinate out of fear and, and whatever, what's to say that they're not going to hallucinate the guards coming to get them? Why would they have to hallucinate Jesus? So they're hallucinating, 100% of them, having a visual hallucination of Jesus simultaneously. And they must have been so similar in the content that they all thought they were seeing the same thing. It's not like Jesus is sitting there, no, he's floating up there, no, he's standing at the door. It's so similar, they all thought they saw the same thing simultaneously. You see the problem with visual hallucinations. And yet we're not looking, or, or group hallucinations, we're not looking at just one group hallucination here. Again, they're either extremely rare, if not impossible. We're not looking at just one, but three. So that's why this early material is so important. It just in itself, it will refute hallucinations. So the fourth thing, fact, is they were teaching, that is, the earliest apostles were teaching that Jesus had been raised from the dead and had appeared to individuals and groups, to friend and foe alike. That leads us to our fifth fact. They were teaching that Jesus was raised physically, bodily from the dead. His corpse came back to life. They said, well, how do you get this from Paul? Remember, Mike, you said you're not using the Gospels. We know about the empty tomb accounts, but as skeptics are so quick to point out, Paul never even mentions the empty tomb. So how do we know it was physical resurrection? I think we got an easy case for this. Paul made it very easy for us. 
In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, again, Paul in this chapter, in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, he's responding to a number of questions the church at Corinth was asking him about resurrection. And he says, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Now, to be asleep was a euphemism used to speak of someone who was dead. Like today, instead of saying that person croaked, we say that person uh, passed away. Uh, in antiquity, rather than saying the person died, they said that person fell asleep and went to be with their forefathers. So, Christ is the first, has been raised from the, the first fruits. First fruits was an agricultural term that referred to the first of the crops to be harvested. So think about it. You, you put a tomato plant in your backyard, some of those tomatoes become ripe before the others. You pick them off and slice them up for a sandwich or something. Well, that's the first fruits. So when he says that Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of the dead, he means that Christ is the first to come back from the dead in a resurrection body. Well, then in that case, when's everybody else coming back? When is the resurrection of other believers going to take place? When are you and I going to be raised from the dead if we don't survive to the, the, the second coming of Christ? What about our loved ones who were Christians who died before us? When are they going to be raised from the dead? Only three verses later, Paul answers that. He says, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits. After that, those who belong to Christ at his coming. So now tell me, when are all of us, when are all believers and those believers who have died prior to the second coming of Christ, when are we going to be raised? Second coming of Christ. Well, now what happens to us in the meantime? Suppose I'm flying back to Atlanta tomorrow and my plane crashes and I die. What happens to me? According to the Jehovah's Witnesses, I go into a soul sleep at that point until the second coming. Jehovah's Witnesses may say that, but they take issue with Paul, who would disagree with them. Here's what Paul says. 2 Corinthians 5.8, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So you can be absent from the body. Philippians 1, 23, 24, you can die and be with Christ or remain on in the body. So if you die, you're no longer in the body. You go to be with Christ. What did Jesus, well, I'll, I'll appeal to, just, this is just Paul. If I want to go to the Gospels, though, I could use Jesus, what he said to the thief on the cross. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Okay? So Paul, according to what Paul's teaching here, when you die, when a Christian dies, their spirit leaves their body and goes to heaven to be with Jesus. When Jesus returns at his second coming, he brings the spirits of dead Christians with him. Those spirits are reunited with their corpses, which are then resurrected, brought back to life, and transformed into an immortal, glorious, powerful body that's animated by the Holy Spirit. That's a physical bodily resurrection, isn't it? For some of those scholars, the skeptics who like to say, no, we're just raised in a spiritual sense. No. Remember, when we die, we go to be with Christ in heaven. We're already in a spiritual sense. And if that's the case, then what's being resurrected since that's a separate event? It can be none other but our physical bodies. And if Christ is the first fruits of the dead, and the dead are going to be raised bodily, physically, that means Jesus was raised bodily, physically. I think if you would have said, but Paul, you didn't mention an empty tomb, he would say, do I have to? I said resurrection. If I talk about uh, uh, an infant dying of SIDS, I don't have to speak of an empty crib. You already can figure that out. If I say resurrection, you ought to know it means the corpse. The stuff that says resurrection is just something that happens to the spirit is something that just skeptics have, have come up with. It's not what the apostles taught. So they were teaching the physical resurrection of Jesus. So those are our five facts. So that leads us to my second major building block, method. We got our facts. What do we do with those facts? Well, how many of you watch House on Mondays? Yeah, we got some House fans here. My family's been watching that for years. And some of you, are, you're afraid to raise your hands. I understand that. Um, but for those of you who don't know what House is, he's this brilliant extraordinarily brilliant physician. And you only go to house when nobody else can figure out what's going on with you. Now, in a sense, you want to come to house because you figure if anyone in the world can figure out what's wrong with me and fix me, it's house who can do it. The problem, though, is he's a jerk. He's an absolute jerk. Bedside manners, forget about it. This guy is an idiot. 
So you want them, but you don't want them. Um, so let's just take an account here and say that uh, they, they got this 15-year-old robust male who's sick, and he comes in, and he says, uh, okay, what's your symptoms, son? He says, well, I've got a fever, I've been vomiting, I've got lower uh, pains in my lower right abdomen. And so House says to his group, who he, his colleagues who he's training, he says, okay, guys, what do you think? And one person speaks up and says, well, it sounds like the flu to me. And House says, well, um, flu accounts for the fever really well because that's pretty much the primary symptom behind the flu. The problem is, is that most people with the flu aren't vomiting and they don't have lower abdominal pains. And so it only accounts for one of his three symptoms well. And so in that sense, your medical diagnosis lacks what's called explanatory scope because it can't account for all of the facts, all of the symptoms here. Well, then another one of his colleagues speaks up and says, well, House, couldn't this be one of those cases? I mean, rare things do happen. Couldn't this be one of those cases where, um, you know, it is the flu, and yes, these other symptoms like vomiting and lower abdominal pains on the right-hand side are, are very rare uh, with the flu, but maybe this is just one of those times that rare things happen. And House says, yep, that's possible, but it's unlikely. You're really stretching it to make it fit. And so it lacks, your diagnosis, it lacks explanatory power. Well, then another person speaks up and says, uh, oh, oh, and then here's what House, he says, moreover, the medical literature, there's nothing in the medical literature that would show that this would be the flu. No cases like this of the flu. So it lacks plausibility. Well, another one speaks up, maybe it's Foreman this time, and he says, um, House, how about this? Let's say this, this, this boy has the flu, but he is a robust male. So maybe he's got martial arts practice that night. So he goes to martial arts practice, and he wants to just push through this flu. And so he's sparring, and he gets kicked in the lower right abdomen. So that explains the pain there. Well, then afterwards, he goes out with his friends and, and for a bite to eat, and he gets food poisoning. So that explains the vomiting now. So now we explain all three of the facts. You're not forcing any of them to fit. And House says, that makes perfect sense. We can do that. The problem is... We don't know if this guy, you're inventing this, we don't know if the guy's a martial artist or whether he was sparring or whether he got kicked in the abdomen or whether he had food poisoning. It's non-evidence assumption, so it's ad hoc. And so it's just a bad diagnosis. He says, let, let me tell you guys something. This is a textbook case. Any physicians in here? Hmm? No physicians? Good, I can make up this stuff and nobody can check me then. <laughs> This is a textbook case of appendicitis. You have this kind of, if your appendix is going bad, this is, this is a textbook case of it happening. House points this out and says, look, you can look in the literature, so it's plausible, it accounts for all of the symptoms, it accounts for them without forcing any of them to fit, and so he's got appendicitis, that's, that's the, the greatest chance, the most probable diagnosis of being accurate. So prep the patient for surgery and remove his appendix. And then Foreman says, well, House, I don't know, let's not be scissor happy at this point. Why don't we do this? Let's send him home, treat him for the flu and food poisoning. And, you know, if he's not any better tomorrow, then we can operate on him. And then House, because he's such a nice guy, he says, Foreman, if we do that and he's got appendicitis, he'll be dead before he can call you and tell you you're an idiot who should have chosen a different profession. No, he's got appendicitis, prep him and remove his appendix. That's how doctors work. That's how physicians work. You can't be, it, it's practice of medicine, it's an art. It, 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 you can't be absolutely certain about a lot of things in medicine. You do your best guess, and if that doesn't work, you try the next best guess. It's the same thing in history. It's the same thing in science. Um, and so that's the way it works in history. So now let's apply this to uh, the, re the facts that we have to see if the resurrection works. When we look at the resurrection hypothesis that Jesus rose from the dead physically, this perfectly accounts for why a number of people, friends and foe alike, had experiences of the risen Jesus in individual and in group settings. It explains all those facts and does so without forcing any of them to fit. It also um, does so without any non-evidenced assumptions. So you could say, well, you're assuming that God exists. Well, no, I haven't, because I haven't said God raised Jesus from the dead. I think God's the best candidate, right? But we, we can't prove that it was God that raised him from the dead um, as historians. 
We can only prove that Jesus was raised. So I haven't brought God into this, but let's suppose I do bring God into this. And I posit him as the theoretical entity that raised Jesus. It's not like there's no evidence for God's existence. If you've uh, spent some time with Wes and attended some of his classes, you can know that there's good evidence for God's existence. Uh, the argument for a first cause, the argument for intelligent design, the argument from uh, objective morality, all these kinds of things, is very, very good evidence that God exists. And even if a skeptic isn't com uh, compelled by that evidence, it's still different from saying there's no evidence for God's existence. Hey, there's evidence against God's existence, the, all the evil and suffering in the world. Am I compelled by the evidence to say that, well, therefore God doesn't exist? No, because I think that's easier to explain in light of all the good evidence for God's existence. So I would say there is evidence against God's existence, but I don't think it's good evidence. In the same way, even a skeptic would be naive to say there's no evidence for God's existence. So it's not a non-evidence assumption at all. Plausibility, I agree. It's completely implausible that God would raise someone by natural causes. By natural causes. But if Jesus was raised, it was almost certainly by supernatural cause, wasn't it? And if God exists and wanted to raise Jesus, well, then it's completely plausible and probable that he would be raised from the dead. Think of it this way. I was in a debate with a skeptic, an agnostic named Bart Ehrman, probably the most influential new, uh, skeptical New Testament scholar in North America. And Ehrman says, let's look at it this way. <coughs> what are the probabilities that Jesus walked on water? Well, let's just say there's 100 billion people who have walked on the earth if you put out a swimming pool with lukewarm, lukewarm water, not frozen, but lukewarm, and told them to walk across the swimming pool, a hundred billion of them would all sink. So the chances that Jesus could walk on water is a hundred billion to one. No, nope, that's bad mathematics, Bart. You see, what if my son, when he was three years old, what if he was the very last one, a hundred billion people had walked across the pool or tried to and sank after the first step? And Zach says, my son Zach at three years old says, Dad, I can't do that. I said, sure you can, no problem. Take my hands. And I take his hands, support his weight as a three-year-old, and I walk along the side of the pool and say, go ahead, Zach, walk on water. And he walks on water. A hundred billion people, unable to do it on their own power, says nothing about whether Zach could do it with help. I say, wait a minute, Mike. But you were helping him. You were an external agent that came into the scene and helped him. Mm -hmm. Same thing with God. If God wanted to raise Jesus, Jesus can't come back by natural causes, but if God wants to raise him, 100 billion people not coming back to life by natural causes doesn't do anything to establish a probability that God couldn't raise Jesus from the dead. Does that make sense? So there's nothing at all implausible about this. In fact, if God exists and as just about every single historical Jesus scholar out there who's even an atheist, an agnostic, or a Jew says Jesus thought of himself as especially chosen by God to bring in his kingdom. He thought he had a special relationship with God, that he was the only way. That he performed deeds that both he and his disciples regarded as miracles and exorcisms. Everybody acknowledges this, even atheists. And I would go even further then, and I'd say, we can prove with reasonable or adequate historical certainty that Jesus predicted his death and resurrection. I can show that historically. You put all that together, that creates a significant context in which now the evidence for the resurrection becomes very plausible. So the resurrection hypothesis meets all the criteria for, for a good historical hypothesis. It doesn't fail any. What about the leading skeptical hypothesis out there? That's the hallucination hypothesis. That Jesus uh, dies on the cross suddenly, his disciples are distraught over the fact that their leader is gone. And what happens when a, a loved one or a good friend is suddenly and brutally killed? Well, even in our society today, they turn to the bottle, right? Get drunk. They have drugs that people take. I mean, back then they had them too. Paul said, don't get drunk with wine, right? So we know people could get drunk back then. We know that they had hallucinogenic drugs. Now, maybe there was another reason they called Jesus the Most High God. <laughs> Some of you get that later over lunch. So, how do we know that they weren't hallucinating Jesus? 
Well, hallucinations don't explain Paul, do they? Because Paul's not grieving over Jesus' death. He's happy he's dead. He's trying to finish out the church and destroy them. It doesn't account for the group appearances, and we've got three of them. So it can't account for the facts. So it lacks explanatory scope. It lacks explanatory power because it has to force things to try to fit. Maybe you have to say, well, this is just one of those rare instances where you have a group hallucination. Three of them? Well, okay, it's very, very, very rare, but maybe, I mean, that happened. You're forcing it to fit, so it lacks explanatory power. Then you have to account for how Paul saw Jesus. Why did he hallucinate? And then you have to invent something and improvise and say, well, maybe he was feeling guilty as he was arresting these Christians and consenting to their executions. They seem to be nice people. Some of them maybe perhaps were family members, and now he's feeling really guilty about this, and he's just looking for an opportunity to want to convert to Christianity. Right. So that's one problem with that. There's not a shred of evidence for it. And so that's complete improvisation. It's very ad hoc. Plausibility? Remember, we talked about group hallucinations? Very implausible. In fact, there's nothing in the professional literature written by mental health professionals that would even suggest that group hallucinations occur today and back something up with a case in which something is, like that is involved. So we see the best, halluc- uh, best hypothesis that's given forward by skeptics can't even pass a single criteria for the best explanation. But the resurrection hypothesis passes all four. Strictly speaking, apart from faith, the resurrection hypothesis is the best historical explanation of the noble historical facts. And it's not just a little bit superior to the second. I mean, there's not even a close second place. The hallucination hypothesis can't meet a single one of those criterion. And so it's the best explanation. The resurrection hypothesis is most probably, historically speaking, what occurred. Now, as a second guesser, I can't tell you how encouraging this is to me. Because it tells me what I originally believed was revealed to me by God's Holy Spirit is being confirmed by historical investigation. And so as we celebrate um, uh, Christmas this week on Saturday, just think about it, that Christmas happened, but there was one thing in God's mind when Christmas happened. It was the beginning, but it was only the beginning. There was one objective in mind when Jesus came to earth. And that was the cross and the resurrection so that we could have eternal life, so that we could have an intimate relationship with God. And so if you're like me and you're just wired that way to doubt, this can be real encouragement. If you know anybody who's wired the way I am or if you know some skeptics at work or at school or in your neighborhood or family, this stuff can be very liberating. It's very encouraging to see that there's really good evidence for this stuff. And it means that if you're going through a difficult time right now, maybe you've had a loved one die this year. Maybe you've lost your job and you're really hurting financially. Maybe you've got some family struggles right now. Maybe your marriage is on the rocks. I don't know what it is, but if you're going through some difficult troubles right now, what the resurrection of Jesus can serve for all of us is to show that we really do matter to God. He cares for us. He loves us. And although he may seem distant at times, This is an emotional thing for us feeling distant from God. But the facts of the matter says that we matter greatly to God. He loves us dearly. Something to ponder on this Christmas season. Let's pray.